Good evening. I would like to both welcome and thank all our partners, uh, family, friends, everybody who could make it here tonight to see the year one Stratos 5 project symposium. My name is Luke Gamasmer, and this year I had the opportunity to be the team manager of Stratos 5. This symposium is the culmination of this year, and we will basically show you what we accomplished this year, what will happen next, and we'll show you a bit more insight into the project. So for those in the audience who don't know, Stratos 5 is part of DARE. And DARE is an organization at the TU Delft. It's existed for more than 22 years, and it exists to form a place where people can experience rocketry firsthand. Uh, we are able to test unique and different concepts, all while ensuring complete safety. And so here, you will see a bunch of different photos of students experimenting, eating together, launching rockets, and collaborat collaborating to a combined goal. So, as the name suggests, Project Stratos, or Stratos 5, is the fifth project in a series of rockets. Project Stratos has always been about striving to build the largest, most advanced rocket possible in DARE. We always attempt to inspire and foster an environment of learning and education for students. In the past, most Project Stratos uh, missions have attempted to reach higher altitudes each time. They have utilized different technologies each time and tried to beat altitude records that were previously unbroken by student organizations. When we came together at the beginning of this year, we sat down as a team and we thought, what will our aim be? What is the next step? And so we took a, a different route. We changed our aim and orientation. And so for you to first understand why we did this, I would like to talk about the dream of spaceflight, why it's important, and then also I will talk a bit about the history and where it is going next. I hope this provides a bit of additional context for you for why a lot of students in here have spent hours upon hours working on design, manufacturing, and testing. And I hope the things that inspire us, we can help communicate those to you, and they will then in turn inspire you. So I think naturally, as human society, we are curious. We seek to understand what is beyond our grasp. And one thing that has always been above our grasp is space. I kind of realized this when I grew up, and one the, like, the thing that really got me is looking up to the stars, to planets, thinking about what is beyond. And sometimes it is really hard to communicate why a subject is so passionate, or why you're so passionate about a subject. Sometimes it is just a feeling. And for a lot of us in here, watching rocket, rockets launch, watching videos explaining different technologies, seeing people collaborate together, these all give us a feeling inside that you can't describe anywhere. And so one of the reasons why I'm really passionate about Stratos 5 is we are building a launch vehicle, but in general, launch vehicles give us or they open up access to this untouchable domain of space. And besides this feeling, there are also a lot of practical reasons to go to space, a lot of reasons why you should invest and you should research different technologies that aid in this. So this is a recent telescope that was launched into space, the James Webb Space Telescope, and it is going to observe and collect data and hopefully we will be able to find out more about the origins of the universe. So experiments like this are essential. They help improve society, and they also, I think, they give us inspiration. I don't know how many of you look at these images and think, wow. I mean, this image to, the, to my right is uh, it's quite an amazing image, and it's something that most would have, if you see it, you can't really explain what it is, but the colors, the lights, 
I think it is very inspirational, and for me, it's, it, it gets my heart going. Um, another thing that is quite important lately would be space constellations and telecommunication systems. So, lately, we have lots of small satellites that are sent up, and they are connected in an array or a network. And these can gather vast amounts of data. They improve how society operates. And with this data, we can become more efficient. So an example of this is Starlink. And Starlink has helped basically provide access to information. And it really helps to democratize many areas of society. The more information people have, the more they are able to prosper. And finally, I would like to talk about satellites that help us understand how the environment is changing. So nowadays, we have satellites that look at the atmosphere, river basins, polar ice caps, pollution, and much more. All of these missions have an unimaginable effect on human society. However, there's one thing in common, and that's they need a launch vehicle to fulfill their mission. They need the right vehicle that is able to put them in the right place, and without that, none of these missions are possible. So, in addition to the importance of space, I would like to take you guys on a journey and talk a bit about the history. So, in 1926, we have the launch of the first liquid rocket. Here you see Robert H. Goddard, and he launched the first liquid rocket. So this contraption you see on screen, it only went to an altitude of 12 meters, and that seems like nothing, but it sets a really strong basis for the future. And another thing is that it was only 20 years after the rocket equation was derived. And this is a fundamental equation that we use to measure performance of these systems. We're going to skip way ahead now, and it is 1969. Humanity has built the largest rocket in existence, and with that rocket, we've propelled humans from Earth to the moon. What's incredible to me is that within a span of 70 years, we went from knowing basic math that describes how these machines should work to actually propelling a human being from Earth to another body within our solar system. And then came along 1981, we had the launch of the first space shuttle. So the space shuttle is interesting because it changed how humans and payloads get from Earth into space. It was the real first attempt to reuse a vehicle, and although it was partially refurbishable, it had high maintenance costs, and it took a long time. And so in the end, it was discommissioned. And now we come to the present, right? Almost every major country and organization, as well as company, has large launch vehicles. All these launch vehicles have successfully allowed us to put payloads into space to achieve these missions I talked about, and we've been able to get more and more and more payload into space. We've even gone to Mars. We've gone, or we've had satellites go study the sun. There's been a lot of development. The one thing that is still quite common is disposable. Um, ten years ago, we had a small company come up, and that was SpaceX. They started to think about reusing rockets, and essentially how we would take this disposable industry and start to transition it into a reusable, a sustainable one. And they ended up doing that. They showed a lot of people in industry that it is possible to take this design that was thought impossible, and they made it a reality. This is another graph that I would like to point out, and this is currently. So it's a few years ago, but in 2021, we had a total of 174 orbital launches. And so what you can see in the graph is that slowly we're trying to put more objects, more research, more payloads into space. One thing that this indicates to me is that we've almost democratized access to space. We're giving more people the ability to carry out research, to put telecommunication systems, to put something into space that will change uh, what we do as society. But the one thing about this graph is that a third of all those launches are carried out by one company. 
And so reusability, cost efficiency, and reliability really plays a big part in being able to launch a lot of payloads repeatedly uh, into space. And so taking all these things into account, we sat down at the beginning of the year and we came up with this mission statement. So we wanted to develop a technology demonstrator for a reusable launch vehicle. Following on from that, at the beginning of the year, we started off as 13 full-timers. And thinking about this mission that we wanted to carry out, 13 people working full-time, although it's a lot, it's not enough. So during the months of June to July 2022, we recruited an additional 47 people. And so that brought us to 60 people in total, which you can see on the screen. Um, as we went through the year, we also found that we needed more people. Um, even with a group of 60 people, the task we had set out to do, it required more people, more engineers, more people to interact with partners, all these different aspects. And so we recruited more, and in the end, we were a group of over 70 students. And that's a massive group, in my opinion. After we had gone through this recruiting process, we began the year of designing. And what we had at the beginning of this was an engine. However, it's no trivial matter that we had just an engine. Engine development takes a significant amount of time, typically. Sometimes it can be up to 10 to 15 years. And what was even more fascinating was that this engine was the first in the Netherlands and for many student organizations around the world. So we started off with an engine and a team. What came next? So a lot of the initial months were team bonding, figuring out how to work efficiently, how you work in a dynamic group, and how we take all these different opinions and backgrounds and we bring them together to make one cohesive team. After that, we started looking at project planning. A lot of the few months were spent in project rooms like this, and we would have different groups huddled around together debating if this was the right idea, if we should go in another direction, how we should do something. And so we spent a lot of the time like that. But that was an essential part of the year because it meant we had a very well-established base for later on. So here are a few things that we produced and we basically brainstormed. We did everything from how the structure of the team should be, so looking at which departments we should have, how management would work, how the interactions with the full-timers and part-timers would work. We went through workflow diagrams. We needed to understand how to get from point A to point B. And it may seem very simple, but there are a lot of steps involved in between, and if you brainstorm them at the beginning, it will be much smoother afterwards. And after that, we also looked at inspiration. So we looked at industry, we looked at past examples of rockets, we looked at past Stratos missions, and we thought, what did they do, and how can we make it better? And so all this project planning led us to turn what we thought would be a year into Stratos 5 being a three-year project. Each year with having, having distinct teams and kind of a distinct goal or mission in mind. So 2023 was the first year of the project. We focused on a lot of design, a lot of high-level project planning, and by the end, we also worked on some prototyping. So there are many novel systems that we hope to use in Stratos 5, and it was really important that we already start designing them and we start testing them from the beginning. Year two will focus on manufacturing, testing, and further iteration. They will take a lot of the systems that we initially designed, they will test them. If they work, they will try and perfect them further. If they don't, they will reiterate. They will think again, why did they work, why didn't they? And then year three, 2025, we will perfect subsystem design, we will manufacture flight hardware, we will finalize launch procedures, and we will ultimately launch Stratos 5. 
So that will involve us launching the rocket once, fully recovering the entire launch vehicle, doing some validation that the systems can still work, checking that structures are intact, and then after that whole procedure is done, we will launch again. So towards February this year, we ended up with a lot of documentation. We had a lot of design reports. In fact, in total, we had something over 900 pages of project documentation. For a student group, this is, I think, quite a lot in the initial months. And we went through everything from avionics to tanks to the recovery system, ground systems, engines. And the reason we did this is because all of this was essential to establish a base that then future years could use. And they could always look back to, and they could always find out why something was done in a certain way. Besides these reports that we made, we also moved to do lots of uh, design reviews. So we would sit with a large group of people, we would present our designs, and we would get feedback from professors, previous DARE members, from industry, and we would try and understand why they thought our designs would work, or if they didn't, what improvements they thought would or had in mind. And finally, in the last three to four months of the year, we really started to get into the prototyping phase. So we looked a lot into these novel concepts and how we would quickly raise the technology readiness level from something that had nothing been done or that had not been done in DARE before to something that would fly as a flight hardware on our system. So here, you can see one of our engineers working on a pressure regulation system, which is entirely new, as Stratos 5 will be the first liquid rocket within DARE. We have one of our engineers working on an engine control unit, which will control the engine. And finally, we have an image of us testing. This was done right here on campus, next to the aerospace faculty, and we're able to test a lot of smaller subsystems. So this is kind of how our year went, and I think everybody grew and learned a lot from it. Now I would like to invite Jan Straczynski, who was the chief engineer. He will talk a bit more about the rocket on a technical level. He will talk about how we approached designing a fully reusable rocket, and in the end, he will show you what the final product should look like. Thank you, Luke. Now, as chief engineer, I have quite intimate knowledge about the design process of Stratus 5. So I would like to give you some insights into how we make things fly. How do you design a reusable ro rocket? First, we start with the requirements, what the system shall do, or how well it should do it. And in the industry, there are multiple frameworks for systems engineering for making requirements. But what we quickly realized is that systems engineering is just a tool for communication. And sometimes what works very well for agencies like NASA or ESA is not very applicable to a small project like ours. Consequently, we have decided to develop our own systems engineering conventions. And throughout research and discussion, we came up with about 1,000 requirements that will allow us to certify Stratus 5 for flight. Now, with these requirements at hand, we start thinking what type of system could satisfy them. In the industry, there are two major approaches in recovering the vehicles to refurbish them and reuse them later. There is propulsive landing, like done by SpaceX, and there is parachute recovery, like done by Rocket Lab. Now, propulsive landing is definitely flashier type of technology. It allows to recover bigger, larger, vehicles. However, at the same time, it requires the use of very complex control loops. And launching a rocket from densely populated Europe um, well, with control loops would require very strict validation procedures, something that's for now beyond the reach of our student team. Consequently, we have decided to go with parachute recovery. Parachute recovery allows to launch the vehicle on very simple ballistic trajectory around which a safe zone can be excluded in case of any anomaly and consequent debris dispersal. 
But such a system is not a joke either. Previously, in Charles projects, we only planned to recover nose cones, the very tip of the vehicle. But right now, we are going to recover the whole rocket, weighing in at 120 kilograms, with a length nearly six meters. And we couldn't find screen large enough, but this is how our parachute will look like. It is a bit underscaled. Um, it, uh, this pattern, you can see, it is a ring sail pattern. It guarantees the best stability in our flight regime. However, it's truly massive. So upon deployment, it would generate a shock load equivalent to a weight of an adult elephant and consequently would break up the vehicle. So how do we mitigate it? How do we solve this problem? We have decided to utilize another system developed within there by a team called Spear2. They develop a system called Rift Parachute. Initially, parachute is folded and constrained by riffing lines. After a set period of time, when the vehicle deaccelerates a bit, these riffing lines are cut by paratechnic wire cutters, which unfolds the rest of the chute. This allows to gradually introduce the loads in the vehicle, decreasing the peak loads, and allowing to recover the vehicle safely. Let me show you how this works in practice. This video was taken by Spear2 in OpenJet facility at our university. You can see that it is initially folded, and at the end of this video, it will unfold. Five, four, three, two, one. Yes! <laughs> So we have discussed how to go down, but before we go down, we need to get up. And Stratus 5 will be the first rocket within there to utilize P-propellant liquid rocket engine. This type of rocket engine is utilized on pretty much every major launch vehicle due to its big efficiency. However, at the same time, it's very complex. Here you can, you can see its testbed in Windsor Air Force Base. There is a gas bundle with either nitrogen or helium. There are propellant tanks that are hidden behind the valve frame. There is the valve frame itself, and there is the engine with its, its thrust structure. The way it works, the gas from the bundle, it pressurizes the tanks and pushes the propellants through the valves into the combustion chamber where they mix and ignite to generate thrust. Now, you can see it's a pretty massive system. It, it is the size of a decent truck. And now imagine we need to take this system and put it in a vehicle that's barely 30 centimeters wide. So how do we do it? We decided to develop our own cryogenic flight valves that are light and compact. They are fully manufactured at our faculty. And you can see it's, despite, of, despite that, it's pretty pretty complex mechanism. At the same time, we are developing a new pressure regulation system that will allow us to achieve steadier pressures in the tanks and therefore enhancing the performance of the engine during flight. At the same time, the engine itself went through another iteration. Its expansion ratio is now more optimized for the altitudes we are aiming for, and its thrust structure is much lighter and much more compact than the one you could see on the photo before. You can see the engine, it is integrated with the flight valves that are connected to the flight tanks. The burn time of the engine is 23 seconds. During that time, it consumes almost 100 kilograms of propellant. And storing them on board of the vehicle is the function of the flight tanks. In theory, they are just metal or composite high-pressure vessels storing fluids, which sounds pretty simple, right? But here's the thing. Manufacturing structures that large is a very daunting enterprise. And it's something that needs to be looked very early on in the design because it can heavily impact it. So imagine that after three months of initial sizing, we realize that our manufacturing timeline is almost three times as much. It, it, it was eight months. Consequent, and it's not feasible, right? Imagine that we need to go through another iteration. This is something that could delay the project by almost a year. Consequently, we have decided to slash our burn time by one third, bringing the apogee from 50 to 25 kilometers. And it was a hard choice, but there are some benefits to it too. Firstly, we could decrease the diameter of the vehicle because we had less propellant on board. 
Now we can source stock in the right dimensions, which can be then manufactured by the 981st Squadron of the Royal Netherlands Air Force in the Winsrock base to create these complex shapes you can see on the screen. Furthermore, we now need less gas, less helium, to feed the propellant tanks. There is now exactly one pressure vessel on the market that satisfies our requirements. And like I said, these type of trade-offs is often very difficult, but as a student team, you have very limited resources. You need to be very flexible when it comes to the performance of your system and very creative when it comes to finding cheap solutions. So we have all of these subsystems, structures, propulsion, recovery, but how are they actually controlled? This is the task of the engine control unit developed by our avionics team. Engine control unit allows to actuate valves placed in, at different positions within the rocket, and therefore it allows to start the flow of the propellants in the, into the combustion chamber where they are ignited to generate thrust. At the same time, they monitor different parameters of the vehicle, like pressure or temperature, that need to be within specific ranges if we want to launch the vehicle. And at the same time, engine control stores these parameters on black boxes for post-flight analysis. Once we ignite the engine, there is very little control over the rocket. We, on, we can only get telemetry from, uh, from downlink, and we can terminate thrust if needed. And it probably does sound quite dangerous launching a rocket filled with 100 kilograms of highly energetic propellants at three times speed of sound. However, here's the thing. We know exactly where our rocket is going, thanks to, the, thanks to our simulations team, which is developing Parsec, new flight trajectory simulation tool, and which is developing workflows for analyzing aerodynamics and structural dynamics of our vehicle. This allows us to very accurately predict where the vehicle is going and to exclude a safe zone around it in case of any anomaly and debris dispersal. So we had all of these departments working very hard to be able to present to you tonight Strauss 5 design. This is how we hope it will look like once we manufacture it and during recovery phase of the mission. So you can see now that the last year was fairly busy for us. The next year will be even busier. This is something Stefan, the next team manager, can tell you more about. But first, Let's see what current team thinks about the project that they dedicated so much time and effort to. Uh, my name is Luke Gamasmer, and this year I was the team manager for Stratos 5. Chief of Structures. Electronics Department. Now I worked on recovery this year. Chief of Propulsion. Structures Department. 
Project Stratos is a student initiative from the TU Delft, uh, from a group called Delft Aerospace Rocket Engineering. The main goal really is to reuse a rocket. So we want to show students and industry that reusable rockets are achievable, they're feasible, and if they can be done by students, they, they need to be done by industry. I am Jan Sturzynski. This year I was chief engineer. There's a number of special things about Strauss 5. First, first of all, this is the first time we are going to launch a B-propellant liquid-powered rocket. Uh, all of our previous rockets, they had much si simpler types of engines like solid propellant or hybrid propellant engines. Explain me the difference between solid, hybrid and liquid. Okay, so solid propulsion has a fuel grain, which has oxidizer and fuel pre-mixed and then cast in a tube with a hole down the middle. And then you stack a couple of these grains and you burn it from the inside out. Liquid fueled engines have, well, liquid fuel. Uh, just inject the, uh, inject the two, uh, mix it, spark it, and then it burns. And then uh, I get something that looks like and it looks like this, comes out the hot end. With hybrids, here, well, right in the center, that's why they call it a hybrid. Uh, you have a solid fuel, again, cast into a grain with a hole down. Zero. And you inject an oxidizer from the top, and, well, that burns with the solid fuel. The advantage of a liquid fueled engine over a hybrid engine is primarily efficiency. Uh, the fuels that you can use in these uh, can push to way higher efficiencies, so you just get more oomph uh, per kilogram of propellant, which, well, you really want in rockets because every gram counts. Uh, secondly, this is also the first time we'll recover almost, like, the rocket that's that big. It, it's 120 kilograms of dry mass, and the recovery system involved is, uh, yeah, quite cutting edge. Hello, my name is Nachike Dige, and last year I was in the recovery department of Stratos 5 as a part-timer. So recovery is really important in any launch vehicle. Recovery is a set of functions that determines how exactly a rocket is going to land safely back on the ground. So Stratos 5 has a very special place for recovery in itself. It's going to be one of the first um, rockets of, of the main flagship Strate that is going to be fully recovered. So compared to uh, earlier rockets, uh, we want to recover the entire thing. So that means you need to have basically bigger of everything, which uh, makes it harder, but also the package things inside of the rocket becomes more complicated. Uh, diameter will be roughly five meters. So we have a really special initial decelerator called a balut. A balut is a hybrid between a parachute and a balloon. These are our main parachutes. These are some examples. Of the one we hope to at least fly in Stratus 5 is actually going to look a little bit like this. It's got a lot of little bits of cloth. These are called ring sails because they're just, um, well, multiple rings of sails. And I think a ring sail, at least in the past, if you've seen Apollo missions as well, uh, they've used, they've opted for ring sails for, well, it's drag efficiency. So that's why we've opted to use them instead of, say, previous designs, such as in Stratus 4 or Stratus 3. So one of my favorite moments of, uh, of last year was manufacturing our balut with, uh, with the rest of the recovery team. It's always nice to see uh, what you have uh, designed and analyzed for such a long period of time come to, come to life. So there's a lot of novel technologies uh, involved. And I think what's special about this project is that it takes these different technologies, different teams in there were working on throughout the years and then it combines them together into one project, one, one system. We are a team of full-time engineers, so people who dedicate themselves for the entire year, nine to five, maybe even more. And we're a team of even larger part-time engineers. We're a total like something 80 engineers right now. So it's a, it's a massive team. Successful team pictures, right? Right? Yes, successful. Team successful. Nice. Start of the documentary. <laughs> Start of the documentary. And so at the beginning of, of the year, I was really anxious. I was afraid that I'm going to waste the potential uh, of my engineers because the role of chief 
chief of structures, chief of the department was new to me. That of course has changed over time. Now I feel more comfortable managing the team. I feel more comfortable working with certain systems within the rocket, of course. I feel accomplished in that sense that I, I created a team that can design pretty much any structural component. Okay, so this is the thrust structure we built this year. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it has been tested and all of the beams are quite bent. But yeah, this was, I guess, the main achievement of myself this year, uh, that we um, had a big production crew who manufactured this and then tested it in the aircraft hall. The, the moment that I will remember for a long time is uh, the compression test of the thrust structure because I started working on it uh, like during, during the winter period and then I, I iterated on the design a lot of times and finally we got to manufacture it and see it work during the test. The moment or the experience that will forever stay with me is going to Bremen for the Space Tech Expo. Uh, to get with us, we wanted to take Stratos 4 and I was responsible for actually assembling the rocket after, after laying for two years in the basement. It's a challenge to actually find all the, all the components, assemble the rockets here on, on campus and then transport it to Bremen. Hello. Uh, so, my name is Kybra and I work as a part-timer at the Structures Department. Uh, I think one thing I achieved was, first of all, uh, work with different type of people because I'm doing the Masters, I was one, at one hand involved with a bachelor. Another thing is you have to convince co companies in order to build something for you, so you have to come up with a good speed, explain to them what you did in the design and so on. So I think that was also quite interesting experience. One of the uh, things that is really memorable to me, it's maybe not very directly connected to the technicalities, but once we had like a meeting with uh, Airborne in their, yeah, in their facility, and we had a nice talk, like we presented everything we had and they were on board on helping us with manufacturing the IPS. And on our way back to the faculty, we dropped by the IKEA, took like a lot of hot dogs and brought that back to the team. And that was like one thing that I wouldn't forget easily. So I have to really think about my favorite machine because there are a lot of machines I really like. Um, maybe the tensile bench, that's a nice machine. A unique project to me is, is the people that I'm working with. Uh, as I said, we, we, we had, and I had the chance to work with very knowledgeable, amazing people and I think we can always design a hardware for a group of engineers but designing a hardware and having fun on the way uh, that's something that's something new honestly <laughs> oh man I love all aluminium alloys but my favorite one I think would be aluminium copper one 2219 it's aluminium alloys frequently used in space missions. It has excellent mechanical properties. It works fantastically in cryogenic environments. And lastly, and most importantly, it's easily weldable. <laughs> you had to spend hours. For me, the biggest challenge I faced this year was definitely going into a role that I had no experience in. At the beginning of the year, I think we were all quite scared we, yeah, we didn't know much. It was a new project. We had to transition from a technology development project all the way to a full rocket development project. Develop a, a lot of methods or kind of tools to successfully get this project off the ground. What's amazing is that you take this break in your studies and you get to do this full time for a year. And like, the recipe to a successful skill is just practice. And so when you're spending 24 hours a day, maybe not, you know, we don't work that uh, intensely, but we work hard at what we do. And when you consistently do that for a whole year, by the end of it, you're, you're really experts in what you do. The proudest moment of this year was when we hot fired our engine. Uh, 
looks like this. It's not this exact one. The nice one is strapped away in a box. But seeing that thing come to life again uh, was, uh, was a very nice moment. Favorite moment that's really tough, I think. The first hot fire we did, uh, since I was allowed to press the button, it was really exciting and I was really nervous for it. But it was really cool afterwards when everything went successfully. Uh, it was amazing, the feeling. A moment that will forever stay with me. Probably long nights before testing and the tests themselves afterwards, uh, particularly the hot fires. Those are the, the amount of work they put into it and then the payoff, even though it's two or seven seconds long, it's totally worth it. It's great. Rocketry is an industry that's it's very exclusive. Not much is known about it. I mean, it's really hard to get into and so if you already have engineers that have had experience building rockets for three years, they're going to come quickly into your company and they're going to be the leaders of the next big company. They're going to be the next big engineers. They're, they're going to really revolutionize uh, the space. And I really can't wait to see what my colleagues and my teammates all get up to in five years because I reckon you're going to see them at a lot of big companies and they're going to be working on the next big thing so Stratos 5 has two more years left and come the summer of 2025 this rocket will launch and I can't wait to see it and I want to encourage everybody on the team let's do this let's make this rocket a reality let's let's finish what we've started and I can't wait to see this thing fly Hope you found that as cool and as inspirational that I did. Let me introduce myself. My name is Stefan, Stefan Yorujo, to be precise. Uh, and I'm honored to be the new team manager of, uh, of Stratos 5. My first contact with the team was actually in a lecture in the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering. I saw a bunch of uh, Stratos 5 t-shirts huddled up in one corner of the, of the, of the lecture hall. And uh, to my surprise, they, they were focused on their project rather than taking notes of, no, notes of the lecture. <laughs> and uh, without judging their academic in interest, of, of course, I, uh, I was more impressed than intrigued with that kind of dedication to that project. Now, fast forward a few months, I'm happy to say that it will be my duty to uh, support and to facilitate this dedicated and ent sorry, enthusiastic team of engineers. 
I would like to encourage all of us to support the idea and the, uh, the joint effort in obtaining the objective of creating a reusable launch vehicle. To recap the past year, that year entailed a lot of organization, as it's a very complex multi-year project, while the priorities were to finish a preliminary design and effectively utilize systems engineering to efficiently manage the project. Moreover, great importance was determined in establishing the supply chains needed to mandate the execution of such a big project. So, this year, as a project matured, we aim to achieve the following objectives. Firstly, we are going to uh, aim for two hot fire campaigns of the new situation of the Firebolt, validating its design and carefully calibrating its performance. Moreover, we are going to perform a full vertical test of the flight structure, ensuring its integrity in flight. Also, we are going to perform drop tests with the flight ready recovery sy system and gain valuable data on, uh, on the recovery loads. Also, we are going to complete the development of Parsec, the simulation tool mentioned by, by Jan, giving us a clear simulation of the flight trajectory of the rocket. Now on the operational side, we are going to prepare the procedures needed for a successful launch and the actual reuse of the rocket. And most, most importantly, we are going to perform a complete integration test from the propellant tanks to the feed, sy feed, feed systems and avionics. Quite a lot of work, don't you think? <laughs> I think so too. But I also think that together we've overcome all the obstacles that we faced last year and together building on our strengths and your support, we will overcome all of this year's challenges as well. And together we will continue the legacy of Project Stratos to launch a rocket to inspire a generation of reusable rocketry. Here, you see the culmination of the Stratos pro projects that advance our understanding of rocketry over the years. Initially, it started off as merely an idea, or rather a dream. But with your consistent support, these dreams blossomed into an incredible, potent reality. And I'm very enthusiastic for this coming year, and I'm excited to... Uh, see to completion. And with that, I'd like to invite Luke onto the stage to uh, close off this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And in order to close the, pro or the symposium, I would like to mention everybody here. Without all your support, without your help, none of this is possible. And throughout the year, we have developed connections like no other. And truly, without these connections, this project would never get off the ground. And one of our teammates, Sebastian Velters, the external relations manager for this year, unfortunately, he is not here right now to say any words. He's off in the US right now doing his exchange. but we have arranged a video where he gives a few quick words, and I would like to show that to you now. Hi, my name is Sebastian, and I was the external relations manager for Stratos 5 last year. Some of you may be wondering, why am I not there to speak in person? Well, that's because I'm in the US. I personally still want to tell a very important message or two action. For those who are expecting me, our partners, 
our sponsors, you were incredibly important to us last year. And you should really know that your contribution was vital to our success of our project. You made our project a reality. Although many of our team can make parts and develop things on their computer, we need your help to make it a reality and to build a true rocket in shape. And thank you for that. Thank you for supporting us and trusting in our mission, believing that we can actually change the aerospace industry for the better. And I truly hope that you will help us in the future still because your help really, really makes a difference. And my second message, I want to thank everyone in last year's team. You created a family for me. You are the reason why I can call many of you friends or brothers or sisters. Just the experience I had last year were incredible. And I will always cherish these experiences in these moments. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I hope you're online and you can see us, and thank you for your part. And finally, to wrap this all up, I would like to thank, again, all the sponsors this year. Your support was invaluable, everything you did for us, all the collaborations we had, it really led the project to a new point, and we can't wait to continue working with you next year. That ends the presentation, however, there will be drinks in the foyer, as well as um, hardware. You are able to meet all the Stratos 5 members. You can see what we got up to this year. There's a VR headset. Put it on. Look at the rocket in real life. It's super cool. Um, but before we go up there, I would like to invite all my fellow team members up onto stage. And let's take a photo to commemorate the end of the first year. Let's, uh, how many people are coming up? Do you want to? We'll go. <laughs> I know, it's amazing, huh? Uh. <laughs>